illustrious speaker who, <laughs> along with all the other illustrious speakers here, um, Ken Timmerman. Um, so I think everybody has had a chance, or most of you have had a chance to grab lunch. And um, I don't want to keep everyone waiting because I know everybody has a tight schedule. So we're going to begin, and when Ken gets here, he can jump right in. Um, my name is Sarah Stern. I'm the founder and president of the Endowment with the Middle East Truth. And I, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here today. Um, this is an extremely important discussion. Um, I was just talking to some of you in the audience. I feel it's, it's a crime um, that this issue has been highly neglected by the mainstream media. Um, and um, it is a human rights issue that we've been waiting for for a very, very long time. Um, as you know, this past Friday, Iranians went to the polls to elect 208 out of 290 politicians for the Majlis, their parliament. Um, and this has been recorded as the lowest turnout in our parliamentary elections since 1979, the year of the Islamic Revolution. Um, this time, there were only about 42.6% of eligible voters who cast their ballots, and in Tehran, the turnout was a mere 25%. The region, the regime, of course, had um, a built-in excuse with the coronavirus and blamed it on the coronavirus. But in reality, there's little wonder why voter turnout was so low. When the Iranian regime had banned thousands of possible contenders from running, most of them reformers. Anybody who contended to um, be in the parliament had to be vetted by the um, Guardian Council, um, which of course works for the regime. And again, it's no wonder, therefore, why the hardliners and conservatives won such a crushing victory. What has never failed to astound me is the amazing and profound, ah, there's Ken. Thank you, Ken Timmerman. <laughs> All right, but, um, So what has never failed to astound me is the profound courage of the brave distance dissidents who've taken to the streets of Iran and the um, face of the regime's profound brutality. Although these original protests have been sparked by the huge increase in the price of fuel in November, the protesters soon began calling for the overthrow of the government. The government quickly began employing tactics like shutting down the internet so that they could close off any communication to the outside world about the protests and to create a roadblock for the protesters to communicate with one another. And this quickly devolved into the lethal shooting of protesters from rooftops from helicopters using machine gun fire. According to the New York Times, the government then confiscated the dead bodies of the protesters and trucked them away so as to conceal the true casualty count. Amnesty International reported that the families of the protesters had been threatened by the regime against speaking to reporters or even attending the funerals of their loved ones. Um, of course, there are varying estimates of the number of murdered protesters. Um, the number I've been hearing most frequently is 1,500. But as um, many are, yeah, 1,500. But as many as um, 7,000 have been jailed and tortured, and some of the protesters that have been taken away by the regime are as young as 15 years old. We're assembled here today to discuss whether or not this might signal the beginning of the end <coughs> of this tyrannical regime, and what, if anything, we here in the United States can do to help. So joining us here today in this discussion are some really illustrious people. Um, maybe we'll start on our left. Um, Ken Timmerman is a wonderful friend of myself and I've met. He's a nationally recognized investigative reporter and war correspondent who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for the work he's done to expose Iran's nuclear weapons program. 
is prominently featured in the film Iranian, and Ken is one of a half dozen true experts on the Islamic Republic of um, Iran and the United States today. Since 1995, he's run the Foundation for Democracy in Iran and regularly um, meets with Iranian dissidents overseas. As a young reporter in 1982, he was taken hostage by Palestinian guerrilla, guerrilla fighters in West Beirut, and, was, um, and that, that was when he had, was born again into his Christian faith. For the past 30 years, Ken has covered both sides of the Arab-Israeli conflict, interviewing radical imams and would-be suicide bombers in Gaza, while reporting on the plight of Israeli citizens during the Hezbollah missile attacks of the 2006 war. He also uh, had the courage to run for Congress in um, the Democratic Republic of Montgomery County. I mean, the Socialist <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, um, and, but I'm really delighted that he can focus all of his energies on this extremely important issue. Um, Wally Far Faris is also a profound friend of myself and of um, Annette. He's an American political scientist, author, and advisor. He served as foreign policy advisor to President Donald Trump during the 2006 campaign and is a senior national security advisor, um, actually with this White House, you know, and also to presidential candidate Mitt Romney. He's a Fox International um, news farm policy and national security expert and frequently appears on national and international media including Arab and French. He's the co-secretary general of the Transatlantic Parliamentary Group, a transatlantic caucus of members of the US Congress and the European Parliament founded in 2008. Dr. Ferris regularly briefs members of Congress and testifies in US congressional committees, the European Parliament and the United Nations Security Council on matters related to international security, democracy, and all Middle East conflicts. He lectures at defense and national security institutions and serves as a consult consultant on international affairs in the private sector. Manda Irvin is the founder and president of the Alliance of Iranian Women, an organization that brings the voices of Iranian women living under the gender apartheid um, of the regime. Um, born in Iran and educated in the United States, Manda was the managing director of the Department of Statistics and International Affairs at the Customs Administration of Iran prior to the 1979 Islamic Revolution. In 1980, Ms. Um, Irving came to the United States as a political refugee and became an American citizen three years later. As a women's um, member, rights activist, and leading expert on Iranian affairs, she's been frequently consulted um, by members of Congress and has testified at congressional briefings, the Helsinki Commission, and the United Nations. In February of 2008, um, Manda was appointed as the United States Delegate to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. In 2012, um, she received the Annette Speaker of the Truth Award. And while it also, I think earlier than 2012, she was one of our earliest honorees. Um, Manda has, um, just came out with a wonderful book called um, The Ladies' Secret Society, speaking about the, um, the history of women in Iran. It's phenomenal. And Harold Rood, another great friend of Annette, is an American specialist in the Middle East. Dr. Rood <coughs> studied and traveled extensively throughout the Islamic world and has studied and done research in universities and libraries in Egypt, Israel, Syria, Jordan, Iran, Afghanistan, Turkey, Uzbekistan. Uh, <laughs> um, he received his PhD from Columbia University in Islamic history under the great late Dr. Bernard Lewis, um, specializing in the history of Turks, Arabs, and Iranians. He spent his life trying to find out the ways that Muslims and non-Muslims can coexist together. Um, Harold has taught Islamic history at the University of Delaware as an adjunct professor. He joined the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy at the Pentagon as an advisor on the Islamic world with a special emphasis on Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. 
From 1994 to 2010, Harold worked as an advisor on Islamic affairs in the Office of Net Assessment and in in-house think tank for the Please Pentagon. Sir, okay, <laughs> he's also very modest. Okay, so um, how should we do this? Should we go down? Um, and would you like to go? Should we go from left to right? It just okay. Thank you, Ken. If you just like to say a few words. Well, this is the first time that I have been on the left. Side, <laughs> sort. So it is a very uncomfortable position for me to be on. Uh, normally I'm to the right of Genghis Khan, but I'll be here on that today. And uh, do you want me to make my presentation now? Yeah, yeah, a right. few words? Or... Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the elections, but at the end of what I'd like to say to you uh, the elections and, and the protests inside of Iran. I'd like to really start with what this is all about. And what it's all about is freedom. The Iranian people lack it, and we have it. This is something that we have that potentially we can share with the Iranian people. Uh, we know that there is this enormous pro-freedom movement inside Iran which rejects the regime. We know because we see them on the streets. We see millions of people on the streets. We saw them just recently after the just killing of Qasem Soleimani, who I want to tell you a little bit about shortly. <laughs> when the regime painted, as it is its wont, enormous American and Israeli flags on the ground in a courtyard of a university in Tehran where everybody walked, thinking, of course, that they were all going to do what they did in the early days of the revolution and at pro-regime events, is walk over the flags. And instead, those of you who were following this, you saw these amazing videos taken from a second story window, looking down onto that uh, courtyard of the crowd just parting like Moses in the Red Sea. And, you know, and there they were going on either side of the flag so they would not trample on the US flag or the Israeli flag. And when some of the Hezbollahis, the regime supporters, brazenly walked over the flag and spat on it, they were loudly cursed by the people who had gone around. An extraordinary event of defiance, of open defiance, and we're seeing more and more of this type of event inside Iran today, as people are losing their fear. Uh, 1,500 people dead, as Sarah mentioned, during the recent protests. That has not deterred the Iranian people from going out onto the streets to express their quest for that one thing that we have that many, many Americans do not value, which is our freedom. It is something so precious. Our men and women are dying for it overseas, uh, and people in Iran are willing to die for it, but it is not always appreciated in this country. I can recall after the just killing of Qasem Soleimani, certain elected officials in this country saying that it was a disproportionate thing for the Trump administration to have done. After all, this man was just, well, I'm not quite sure what he just was. He was the head of the Quds Force, right? He was a Revolutionary Guards general. He was a murderer. He was a torturer. But he was just, I guess, an Iranian official in their eyes, and they thought his killing was disproportionate and would bring about a enormous, an enormous retribution against the United States all across the Middle East. In fact, it was going to turn the Middle East into a tinderbox, which of course it's never done. Right? Uh, now, since then, we've not seen an awful lot out of the Iranians. Uh, we saw that brief uh, missile attack, which apparently they were so very careful to uh, give warning to the Iraqis that our forces and the Iraqi forces uh, evacuated the bases or at least went down into shelters and, and, and thank God nobody was uh, killed. Uh, so that was their response. A lot of chest thumping, a lot of uh, rhetoric, but they did nothing. For once, and this is an important thing to remember, the Iranian regime, to paraphrase Khomeini, could do nothing. Now that's what they've been saying about us for 41 years. Now, you might remember during the hostage crisis, some of you here can remember that, 
Khomeini loved to go on the BBC, on French television, uh, on American television, go with, be represented on Nightline with Ted Koppel, who got a start during the high hostage crisis, and say, America can do nothing. We are here to say, stay, America can do nothing. I don't control these hostages, but America can do nothing. Now, it is the Islamic State of Iran that can do nothing. I do believe that they are in a death spiral. Now, I want to tell you a few things about Qasem Soleimani and why nobody should be sh shedding any tears, not even crocodile tears, for this man's demise. Uh, and I've had a little experience on the ground with uh, Soleimani and his minions. Uh, I was in Beirut as a young reporter in 1983 in April when he, uh, Soleimani's people blew up the U.S. Embassy, 63 people were killed. We did not realize it was him in the beginning. It took a long time for us to understand who was actually behind it. When some of the families and survivors of the victims uh, of that attack went to court in 2003, Admiral Ace Lyons, who some of you may remember, brought in a sealed envelope the uh, <coughs> dispatch that the United States government had intercepted two weeks before the attack on the Marine Barracks in November of that year, giving the order from Tehran to their ambassador in Damascus, who was then the flow between two Hezbollah, Imad Mubniye, their man on the ground, to attack the U.S. Marines. So we had, at, by that point, there were people at the top of the United States government, starting with the Secretary of Navy, uh, the head of the NSA, the, the um, military advisor to the Secretary of Defense, who knew about this. Now, I interviewed Kathleen Weinberg a couple of years before he died for my book, Countdown to Crisis, The Coming Nuclear Showdown with Iran, which I would argue is still the best book on Iran. It tells you about the genesis of the Iranian nuclear weapons program from the inside, told by Iranians and people who were either family members of the regime leaders or who were personally involved in it. It talks about the relationship with North Korea. It talks about their direct material, material involvement in the 9-11 attacks on America, a story that I learned from multiple defectors from Iranian intelligence. And just so you know, you can now get it in a digital format if you go to my website, <laughs> kentimmerman.com. Right? <laughs> the publisher never put it out as a Kindle version. I finally put it out as a Kindle version, and you can get it for three ninety nine. So that's a scoop, right? You can get that and read some of these stories and understand the background. Because in that book, you will understand everything that's been going on behind the scene that leads us up to where we are today. And where we are today is we now have a president who has decided to break the stalemate. We now have a president who's decided to take the war back to Iran. And I don't mean militarily. We're not going to invade <coughs> Iran. There's no, there's no even talk of invading Iran. It's not in the plans. Uh, it's not in the wish list. The president doesn't dream of invading Iran at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's not going to tweet about it at 4. But it's not going to happen. We don't have to do that. But what we do have to do is to demonstrate to the Iranian regime that they can do nothing. And the killing of Qasem Soleimani on January 7th this year showed them that the man they considered to be the architect of their expansionist policy across the Middle East. He was the architect of Hezbollah, the architect of the war in Syria, the architect of the war in Yemen, the architect of the plan to kill American soldiers all across the Middle East. Over 600 uh, Americans, American troops were killed in Iraq through explosively formed penetrators supplied by the Quds Force of Qasem Soleimani. And by the way, another plug for my website, if you go to the second page of the website, kentimmerman.com, where it says you can read more of my articles, you'll see right up there near the top, there's a three-minute video, which I made a couple of years ago with an Iranian friend, Bakman Maghazadi, about Qasem Soleimani. We call it the crimes of Qasem. <laughs> uh, 2000, uh, yeah, about three years ago, we made that video. And the person who, the two people who star in that video, one is Staff Sergeant Robert Bartlett, who was blown up in Iraq by Iranian uh, EFP, this uh, uh, explosively formed penetrator, and who bears the scars to show it. And he tells a story. He tells what happened, and he says, you know, what were the Iranians doing there, uh, killing Americans in Iraq? We didn't invade Iran. They were killing us in Iraq. What was going on? 
And the other person who was interviewed was the Gold Star widow of another service member who was killed uh, in Iraq by an Iranian explosive penetrator. And what did we do when the Iranians were blowing up our soldiers in Iraq? We did nothing. We had an opportunity in 07 when the military arrested five Quds Force officers, including a general in Erbil. Those people had extraordinary intelligence. They played a key role in the Iranian networks in Iraq. Again, networks that were aimed at killing Americans. And we had them. We had them like that. And it was word that they were talking. The Iranians were going nuts. And so finally, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was either this guy, Mohandas, who was killed with Qasem Soleimani or one of his buddies, they orchestrated a kidnapping murder of five American soldiers near Karbala. And said, okay, you've got five of ours, we got five of yours. How about a trade? Oh, sorry, uh, we killed them. No trade, but we want them back anyway. And we gave them back. We gave them back. We gave back the guys that we had as leverage. So President Trump is the first one who has started to take this war back to the Iranians. And I want to say this about the sanctions and about the protests and then hand it over to Robert. <coughs> and what he has done after getting out of the Iran deal, the bad Iran deal, let's not forget, this was a really bad deal that guaranteed the Iranian regime would become a nuclear weapons state within 10 years at the very most, at the very most, with a nuclear weapons arsenal. But what this president has done through the sanctions imposed on the regime has been to hit the head of the snake, to let them know, the leaders of the regime, that they can no longer pilfer, plunder, rape, and murder their fellow citizens and get away with it with big bank accounts in Western countries and multiple entries, if not green cards or permanent residence papers in Germany, France, and Italy. They can no longer get away with that because we're going after their money and we're not going to let them keep their money. And the Iranian people are starting to see this. And inside Iran itself, you've got folks in the cyber army, you've got folks in the Revolutionary Guards who are seeing the writing on the wall, and they're stealing like mad from their brothers and sisters inside Iran, from their brothers and sisters in the IRGC, from their brothers and sisters in the cyber army, and people are seeing this. They aren't duped. The sanctions policy and I'm going to conclude with this, is the single most effective thing that we could have done short of war. Remember, this is what you know, Jeff Jefferson's famous comments, uh, you know, sanctions are the only thing, only policy option you've got between appeasement and war. Well, it's true. It was true in 1803 against the Barbary pirate, pirates. It's true today against the Islamic State of Iran. These sanctions are hitting them so hard their oil exports had plummeted to near zero, a couple hundred thousand barrels a day, and much of that is being done on the black market with ship-to-ship -ship transfers and all kinds of stuff, which are not very lucrative. They're selling at a huge discount for little that they're selling. It is hitting them really hard. And at some point, we don't know when that point will come, there will be a, a moment, a tipping point. Some thought it would have been the down of Ukrainian airliner. Who knows? But there will come that tipping point when the rats on the ship start to leave. And when you see the lads, rats leaving the ship, you know that's the time to go. And just as with the start, stock market, all of those people, they're going to wait until the very end. They're going to wait until the very end. And as they start to, to, to jump, the ship's going to sink. Thank you. Thank you. On that sharing note. <laughs> Thank you. First, thank you, Sarah, and your board for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Very pleased to be with prominent speakers, top experts on, in the field. What I would like to talk about briefly is the battle here in Washington, D.C., about Iran. How we are divided or united, how we do the right thing or not. Give it some historical perspective, a couple of minutes, and then land uh, at, at, at the moment now. Where, where are we in this matter? The Iran regime 
started a unilateral war on the United States in 1979. There was no history for it. By doing what they've done with the hostages, the embassy, the first crisis, then they moved to ally themselves with Assad in the 80s, and they engaged a second battle with the United States in Lebanon by Hezbollah, the attacks against the Marines barracks, against the embassy, the hostages, the whole decade. I was living there at the time in the 80s, so I saw that closely. And in the 90s, they moved to consolidate with Assad, consolidate with Hezbollah, and develop their networks around the world to become a global force. This is when they started to move into Africa, into Latin America. They did the attack in, uh, in Argentina, two attacks in Argentina. So you can see that the Iranian regime is not just a nationalist, patriotic regime that defends Iran as some in America and in Washington are claiming. It's a moving, it's a Soviet Union-like imperialist force that is moving to achieve a goal, let alone, of course, using their arms to engage against the Israelis, and that was for decades through Hezbollah, Hamas, and others. Now, what were the reactions here in Washington? How did we perceive uh, that growing threat in the region? Under Reagan, meaning when the Iranians uh, clashed with the United States, there was a firm response, though it was a limited response. We still had the Soviet Union. So Iran was a new player. And there was the clash in Beirut when you were there, 83, 84, 85, and then withdrawal from Lebanon. After Reagan and into the 90s, assuming that uh, uh, the Bush second administration was busy also in uh, containing what was happening in the Middle East, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the Iraq War. So now we are post-Cold War, and we have the Clinton administration. During the time of the Clinton administration, there was no American action to contain Iran, and there was no Iran deal. It was just the Iranians are there, a focus to try to solve the Arab-Palestinian conflict without really solving the bigger problem, which is Iran's regime that's blocking the Arab-Israeli conflict. So it's nothing, nothing has really happened with regard to this policy with regard to Iran. Then obviously we had 9-11 leading to Iraq. And this is where things became strategically serious between Iran and the United States. It's over Iraq. Because by 2001, Iran has evacuated American and Western influence from Iran, has linked up with the Assad regime, has, with the Assad regime, occupied Lebanon through Hezbollah, and has pushed around the world. What was the piece that was missing for the Iranians to have the full control from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean Sea? Iraq. So when we invaded Iraq, somebody else invaded Iraq with us at the same time, but in an under, uh, you know, underground way. So when we pushed Saddam out, a number of the factions, the armed factions, that were in exile in Iran, those who became the militias, came in. So there was a battle, back and forth, between the US presence and those Iranian militias. It was the beginning of Iranian actually killing American servicemen and servicewomen in Iraq, that was the beginning of it. And that struggle continued for years until an administration, the Obama administration, decided to change the entire US policy and positioning with regard to Iran. This is, we are now inheriting that change of policy, which in my view, historically speaking, really started in June of 2009. Two things happened in June of 2009. Number one, the Iranian people rose the Green Revolution. <coughs> Washington was silent. Actually, it was not that silent. Former President Obama issued statements, he made statements in public saying that we are not going to be meddling with this because we will be seen as intervening from the outside. This is the typical stereotype 
uh, statement that pro-Iran people would, would say on campuses. Oh, don't help the Iranians because they would be seen as backed by the Americans. They would lose. This is the theatrics. So that position by the previous administration, which I publicized then on Twitter and later, was the genesis of a new US policy on Iran, which is to engage the Iranian regime. Instead of engaging the Iranian people, we chose to engage the Iranian regime. Now, that engagement, to go very quickly here, led to the Iran deal. So between 2009 and 2015, there were those years where we were negotiating, we were back and forth. At minimum, I would say, we were positioning ourselves not to clash with the Iranians, despite what the Iranians were trying to do in the region. And many would ask us, but during the Arab Spring, there was the revolt in Syria. That was before that, uh, you know, uh, revolts in, in many other places. Why didn't the United States during the Arab Spring, for example, choose, and they could have, in the first six to seven months of the Syria revolt, help them against the regime, which was an ally of Iran, precisely because the Assad regime was an ally and is an ally of Iran. That's the reason. In preparation, it's, it's not about liking the Iran regime, no. It's about an architecture of the previous administration and the elites behind them and the intellectual establishment and the academics and the, the companies that were interested in moving into Iran and do business. It was a whole construct that rationalized the idea that we need to become partners with that regime. We know they're not great, they're not social democrat, they're not liberal, they're not, you know, any of the political parties that we know, they, they admit that. But we need to engage with them and get to the point of having the Iran deal. And the rationale was that if we free the frozen amounts of money to the Iranian regime, then the Iranian regime somehow will start doing business and somehow they will moderate and somehow they will open their borders. You know the rest of the story. It's, it was a wrong analysis by the Obama intellectuals and those who designed that uh, agreement. Agreement was signed in 2015. It allowed Iran, I'm not going to add what you already know, 150, access to $150 billion. Now when the Iranians received that amount of money, plus that European companies started to do business with Iran, plus the promise for American companies, including large companies here, to do business with Iran. The $150 billion are really the tip, was supposed to be the tip of an iceberg of a much bigger block of money to travel into Iran. What we're supposed to get from Iran, moderation, that they would moderate, that they would rein in on Hezbollah and others. Now, that doctrine, the Obama doctrine and the Iran deal doctrine, changed the, in my view, the landscape, the political landscape in Washington, D.C. And there is one aspect of it that is a uh, problem, in my view. The Iran regime received huge amounts, budgets. And of course, as a regime, they want to protect themselves. How do they protect themselves? They would buy more weapons. They bought the Russian weapons. They modernized everything they've got. They funded the militias. And Mr. Soleimani, that was mentioned now, is and was the coordinator of all these militias that got the money from the Iran deal and expanded in Iraq with all the control. They had a maximum control. Meanwhile, on Iraq, the previous administration released Iraq from us, but released it to the Iranians. If they have released Iraq to the UN, Iraq to the Iraqis, Iraq to Sweden, or anybody else, fine. But they released it basically to these militias who formed the next cabinet, funded later by the Iran regime. See, the, I'm doing an x-ray of the actual situation to, to understand how the Iranians themselves became so impulsive and you know, thinking that they could stop the United States anytime because of what we've offered them, recognition and money. Now, quickly from here, there is an aspect that I found, I, I mentioned I found troubling, is that the Iranians engaged in a massive, strategic communications PR operation, which was spotted by most experts on Iran worldwide, including, of course, in the United States, and they were 
panels in, in Congress that examined the matter by funding all the way from TV stations in the Middle East, radio stations, networks, internet, bloggers, social media, to such a point that this large pressure had an impact on the West at the end of the day. Iran was portrayed as, for example, the protector of the Christian minorities in the Middle East for five, six years. I have been on this issue of minorities for 25 to 30 years, and suddenly I would hear heads of churches, NGOs, foundations, oh, Assad is good, Iran is protecting the minorities, and of course they took advantage of the fact that ISIS was going up, so Iran positioned itself, itself through the media that it influenced and most likely paid on both sides of the Atlantic to portray Iran as not that bad enemy. And I'm driving all that road to get to the point here that while in the 80s, the majority of the American public and of our lawmakers looked at Iran as the bad guy. Some wanted to do something, others didn't want to do much about it. Now there's something else that has happened since 2015. There has been an influence operation which impacted many, many people of those interested in current affairs in the Middle East, of course, whereby there was a change in the perception of Iran. And in, on university, in, in campus, on campuses, in the media, online, and in the political world. The vision, the American vision of Iran is divided. Partly because of the Iran deal supporters, because the Iran deal supporters till now are not accepting, did not accept the fact that President Trump and his administration withdrew from the, from the deal. Yes, as an executive power, we are not in, in, engaged with the Iran deal, but we have a whole part of our political establishment and our academic establishment that are still for the Iran deal. And they are banking on many things to go back to the Iran deal, including the elections, obviously, next, uh, next November. As simple as that. So bringing ourselves to current times, what are the indications that we are divided on Iran, politically speaking? While the administration has withdrawn from the deal, put the Pasdaran Iranian Revolution regard on the designated list of terrorism, designated as many leaders as you can dream of in Iran on that list, and more of Hezbollah. Actually, today, another list of sanctioned leaders of Hezbollah was put up. This administration has done with regard to Iran as much as all the administrations since 1979 combined. <laughs> Correct? All right. Yeah. So that's reality. On the other hand, obviously the president goes to Riyadh. He forms, in addition, in addition to our traditional strategic ally, Israel, which of course he reinforced that uh, alliance, he formed and launched an Arab coalition in the center of which we have Saudi, the UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, and others, to also contain Iran. I mean, this was an architecture that was not there before specifically to contain Iran. And on top of that, when the protests began, Beirut, Baghdad, but specifically in Iran, and they'll talk about that, then we had those tweets. Tweets are also a political expression. And we had statements of solidarity <coughs> with the Iranian people, which is in so much con contrast with the 2009 statements that we don't want to make. Now, when we come to what's happening right now, here's the problem. The administration has chosen to contain and reverse Iran's influence. The opposition, I'm going to call it the opposition in general, because it is bipartisan at the end of the day as well, is opposing this. There was a legislation in this building, I guess, to limit the powers of the president when it comes to Iran. If it was in general, be my guest. I'd love to debate, everybody would love to debate limitations of this branch versus the other branch, fine. But when a legislation is about to limiting the power of a president versus that regime, it's serious. It means this is, this is basically aiding the Iranian regime to escape actions the president and his administration can't do. Now, of course, there are many lawmakers who oppose it. Second, when another legislation was proposed to have a solidarity with the Iranian people. The opposition opposed it. That, to me, was the red line that was crossed. I mean, I understand. You don't want this president 
to go full-fledged against the Iran regime. Okay, we'll see in November. But now you don't want a part of the Congress to declare solidarity with the Iranian people while they are under suppression. That indicates to me that the supporters of the Iran deal basically are obstructing our policy with regard to Iran. It's, it's so clear, <clears throat> even the public opinion in the Middle East more so than here, um, understood that point. Now why, my last point. Need a new Congress. Why, <laughs> I leave it to the discussion. Why the American public is not really aware of those nuances. When it comes to Israel, we understand every bit of the name. When it comes to India and France, other places. But when it comes to Iran, the American public is a little bit disoriented with what's happening. Is it a bad guy, or uh, as my friend said, that Soleimani was a general, was just a regular general doing kermis in, in, in Iran? Or was he the head of a terrorist network? And by the way, few have noted that he's the head of a designated terrorist organization. And he was planning operations against us. I still cannot comprehend how the opposition in Congress and outside Congress said, well, this is an act of war. But he was waging war against us. But I'll leave that to the discussion in general. So now we are in a situation, I believe, between now and November, whereby the administration is pushing in that direction, and it has many allies in Congress, and the opposition is opposing this. So this is a reality that we need to always see when we are trying to project what will happen the next few months, and beyond that, the next few years. Thank you. historian and when I um, retired from the Department of Defense 10 years ago already, what I was working on before is context. How do you understand the people that you're dealing with? That's what historians do. And I would like to talk a bit about how to understand the Iranian mindset. <clears throat> and for those of you who want, they're free. This is a, something that I had written a little example of the sources of Iranian negotiating behavior. And it basically is a compilation of uh, stories. I went to university in Iran during the early and mid uh, stages of the revolution in northeastern Iran in a city called Mashhad, one of the cities which is really suffering today from the coronavirus, as is Qom, the other spiritual center in Iran. If you want to talk about this afterwards, it's fascinating what is going on in Iran by the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime, these are signs of pilgrimage. These are people who come and they get infected and they go home and bring this disease to their people. And I just want to tell you the Iranian regime uh, is into what they call Islamic medicine. Now, to the best of my knowledge, medicine is medicine. There is no Islamic, there's no Jewish, it's science. But they have trained 18,000 uh, people in, the, in Islamic medicine. The regime, the senior leaders of the regime have said that uh, this, what is going on now, uh, Islamic medicine has the answer. We don't believe in quarantine. Uh, these are things of the past. Um, now, uh, I, I don't know how I can say this politely. I'm going to say what we heard when I was when we were driving in. Um, Islamic. One of the senior leaders of Iran has just uh, a few hours ago mentioned that there. What Islamic medicine requires here is there is a solution to the corona violent, uh, virus. And that is you take cotton balls and there is this vile, uh, oily substance. You put them on the cotton, um, in the cotton balls, and then you insert them in the one orifice that both men and women share in common down below. Mm -hmm. That will solve your problem. Now, um, God willing, it'll work, but I tend to believe that uh, uh, it won't. And that's the problem. Iran is really becoming a center, a 
very serious center of the coronavirus. God knows what's going to happen, and we're going to find out what the people of Iran, uh, is this a, a straw that breaks the camel's back? The Iranian people know this is uh, garbage, but that's what it is. Um, there are pictures I can actually show you of, of Iranian ayatollahs on, uh, on TV saying uh, that anybody who is infected by the coronavirus is not a Muslim. No, they're not following Islamic teachings, but that's really, if you really want to discuss this, uh, something for later. Now, I want to talk about my own experience in Iran, what I learned from this, and uh, maybe come up with some ideas of how we can understand what to do, or how can we can help the Iranian people, and that's our job, to help the Iranian people. I agree, I'm not sure whether it was Walid or Ken, there's no need to invade the country. Believe me. Um, how do we understand how the people think? I, when I studied in Iran, I was in the grand old age of 28. I'm now 70, so it's a long time ago. And um, I had read a ton about Shiism, and that's the reason I went to Iran, to study about Sh uh, Shiism. The purpose of this was to understand the mindset. So God willing, we could find a way to make peace between Muslims and Jews, in this case, the Shiite Muslims. Now, I know my books told me when I studied all this in, 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 you know, in my graduate studies, that all Iranians have a grand ayatollah that they or their families support, they look to for guidance, if they have uh, financial problems or food problems, they look for these ayatollahs to support them. And it's all done by families. And I knew at the time the names of six grand ayatollahs. Now I am asking, in a nice, sweet American way, I'm asking all my fellow students, Iranians, and who is the grand ayatollah that your family follows? And Iranians are the most, they're a wonderful people. And they're very good looking people. And they look you straight in the face. And they looked at me as if, they didn't know what I'm talking about. Now that's the equivalent of asking a Christian, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? And the answer is, uh, no, who is he? <laughs> it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a little odd, but this, I got this over and over again. No, not, you know, this, you don't know who the grand ayatollahs are. And I began to list names of six. The last one I rarely mentioned was a guy by the name of Khomeini that I didn't know almost anything about. I knew that he was originally, he was, in 1963, he was thrown out of Iran, the Shah threw him out, and he went to Iraq. But I didn't know much more about him. And I mentioned these six names, and all these sweet people are looking at me and smiling, and they don't know what I'm talking about. Fine. All of a sudden, riots start occurring. And in Iran, they have a very fine sense of knowing where power is shifting, where power is going. Um, we Americans are clueless on that. We thought that when Ronald Reagan replaced Jimmy Carter, that uh, this was to us unbelievable. Oh my God, it's a complete change. But we knew that we could wake up the next morning and nothing would happen to us. Uh, uh, but that to us is change. But in Iran, if you're not on the right, the winning side, you could die. And so, they have developed over the years a very fine sense of when things are changing to know it. So I mentioned to all my students, as my, my, excuse me, my students, my fellow students, and then the Shah, the, the windows universities are breaking, <laughs> there, there are riots, and my fellow students, my friends are out in the street yelling, death to the Shah, greetings to or long live Khomeini. As a nice American, you know, we don't lie when we look at someone else in the face. I got mad because these Iranian, my fellow students, were obviously lying to me. I mentioned Khomeini. So I'm furious, excuse me, I'm furious. I go back to my dorm room. All of a sudden about six guys, Harold, 
Can we speak with you? I'm furious. Yes. They come in, they close the door. And anybody know French here? Because French and Persian are back here. <laughs> they close the door very quietly, say to me, and they're out in the street screaming. That's the shah along with Khomeini. Khomeini ki e? Ki e Khomeini in French? In Persian it's backwards. Who is Khomeini? I realize that I don't know what I'm talking about. I completely misunderstand everything here. Why? They didn't know who Khomeini was, but they remembered that I mentioned his name. And they knew he was the one who was clearly uh, you know, going to take power. He was the strong man, and the Shah was weak because he did put all these riots down. Let me just give you one other little story that happened to me. I'm also out watching all these, these riots. In Persian, the language of the major language of Iran doesn't have the word a or the. So if you hear the word Shah, you will know only from the context whether it's a Shah or the Shah, the one who was in power at the time. And they're all yelling, we don't want Shah. And then a bunch of whatever police or who knows what comes and starts to beat a few heads. And the, slot, the, the chance changes ever so slightly too. We don't want Shaw. Why do we want another? We have one. <laughs> they, wherever the power is, that's where they are. They know what they're doing. It's very hard for Americans to understand this mentality. The truth is it's very hard for Iranians to understand when they're talking with fellow Iranians. Because are they being told the truth? Remember the purpose is to protect yourself, that God forbid something goes wrong. And you want to be on the winning side. I want to quote for you, a, there was a British ambassador in the 1970s, Sir Dennis Wright. And he wrote a summary of his time in Iran. And he says the following, and please, it's going to sound confusing. The Iranians are a people who say the opposite of what they think and do the opposite of what they say. That does not necessarily mean that what they do does not conform to what they think. If you notice it's that everything is included here. Everything. And that is why it is so hard for Americans who, well, we may not say everything that we think, but if we're going to lie or something, or say something which isn't really in our mind, we invariably will like, you get it from the eyes, you'll look away, you won't look at someone straight in the eye. That's what our culture is all about. They are not lying. They are trying to protect themselves. The amazing thing about Iran is when the Muslims invaded the country in the 640s, 50s, this, by that time, Iran had been an empire for 1,100 years. They, when those same Muslims took over what is today what we call the Arab world, within a hundred years they had all become Arabicized and were well on the way to becoming Islamicized. Iran, Iranian culture goes underground. Iran is not an Arabic speaking country. Yes, there are Arabs in Iran, and they're in particular is basically along, let's say, the Iraqi border, by and large. But Iran found the way to survive Iranian culture. And 300 years later, Persian immersion, let's call it modern Persian, which is used as a lot of Arabic words, but they were Persians, and they were the ones who told the Arabs who were desert nomads, as you say in, in Persian, no, um, uh, lizard eaters, rat, rodent eaters, that's what, Arabs think of desert nomads, excuse me, what Iranians think of, 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 of Arabs by and large. This is just a translation in English of what they say. They managed to, Persian culture, Iranian culture was, it reemerged. Oh yes, we're Muslims. And you great um, Muslim uh, rulers, we're Muslims like you. Uh, we'll teach you how to rule. We only had an eight, an empire for 1,100 years. You had nothing. We, they, they would never say it so polite. We'll tell you how to rule, how to run large things, because we, that's, that's our history, which is what they did. So you have this odd marriage of Iran, and Persian culture, ancient Persian culture, and Islam. Frankly, they're like oil and water. 
Shiism in Iran, I've heard many people tell me it's an Iranian religion. It's not, and they can prove to you, historically, and factually it's incorrect, that um, Iran, uh, that, uh, that the, the, what is the Shiite leaders of Iran, the, the, the Imams, the first descendants of the Muslim prophet Muhammad, that they were Iranians. They were Persians. It's not true, but they have a way of proving it. Now, one of the other things that you hear policymakers talk about is playing the ethnic card in Iran. And this shows a complete lack of understanding of what Iran is. It's an empire. And the largest group in Iran, from my point of view, this, the Soviets were excellent at these type of statistics, is probably the Azeris. Azeris are a Turkish-speaking group, mostly from northwestern Iran originally. But I, when I first went, the first time I went to Iran, I spoke an okay Turkish. Azeri is Turkish. And um, in Tehran, eight out of 10 people I could speak with, with no problem, speaking Turkish. Um, but who are these Azeris? Azeris believe that they are the original Persians, that they spoke Persian, they are the Medes and the Parthians, they are the ancient peoples of Iran, who in the 1400s there was a, 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 a Turkic leader that captured Iran named Timurlan, and he hated everything Persian. And according to the Azeris, he cut out 400,000 tongues of Persian speakers, which is why these Azeris today, who are the true Persians, speak Turkish. They speak Azeri. Now, you imagine that, and here you want to try to divide between these people. The, if I'm correct now, and, and Manda, you're going to know much better than I, the founder of the Pahlavi dynasty, they, they, they had, which had two shahs in about, was it 1916 or so. Um, the wife of Reza Shah, the founder, had an Azari wife. He was from Mazandaran, which is northern pure. It's the first time he had a pure Persian speaker for real, ruling Iran in a long while. His son, who was the last shah of Iran, is married or was married to an Azari. She's still alive, and this is one hell of a, uh, a tough cookie, she's, uh, she should be the real, you know, she's old and she's not, she could run the country. Um, and their son, Reza Shah, who I want to talk about in a moment here, uh, Reza, who's named after his grandfather, who lives in Potomac, Maryland, right outside of here. Uh, really, really nice guy. His wife is Azari. No, and they're all Iranian, and they all speak Persian, and the wives all speak Turkish too, Azari Turkish. But they're really the real Persians. Now I know how confusing that sounds. Now you want to try to divide between the Azaris and the Persians who together make up, I want to say, I'm just going to come up with me, 70, 75, 80% of the country. It's absurd. But Americans, I've heard, want to play the ethnic card. Now, I want to tell you that I, when I, uh, uh, retired from the American government at age 60. To the best of my knowledge, I was the youngest uh, uh, person in the American government who in either the policy or the intelligence community, and I don't really know the intelligence community well, who lived in Iran and, and lived in, a, shall we say, an Iranian life, as opposed to the businessmen who were among their own and native Iranians, which I, of course, am not. I'm of European Jewish extraction. Anyway, um, there's a feel that you get by living in these countries, which almost all the people dealing with Iran, I'm now 70. I left at the age of 28. They don't have. They don't smell it. They don't get it. A few days on ground, if you know something about the culture, you can begin to put it together. We unfortunately don't have that. Reza Shah, Reza, the, he calls him, he's called RP, Reza Pahlavi, or Royal Prince, if you wish, whatever. He's a great man, he's a, he's a really wonderful human being. And I want to tell you, I don't think he's the greatest, potentially, he, he's not a king, he's not a, a strong leader. But he's the only one in Iran that has complete name recognition anywhere. 
He could be the glue in a change of regime, which when it happens, I think will happen very quickly. Uh, who could preside over it? I don't know, a group of people. Who, how do we include everybody? That's what kings and queens do. They keep everybody in the system. Maybe he can help, not as king. The Iranian people will make its own decision. I want to just say one last thought. Um, if you want to understand what Iran is, people like analogies and they like stories. Imagine you'll have a little boy who's thro throwing, is it lit matches or lighted matches on into a pail of gasoline-soaked rags. Gasoline doesn't ignite. The fumes are what unites. Uh, excuse me, ignites. And there's this little boy throwing. Iran is that pail of rags. And the, the, this little boy is just nonchalantly throwing these matches, lit matches. And one is going to explode. We don't know which one. We don't know how many. But it's going to happen. I have been totally wrong, because I've been dealing with Iran since I left Iran, on when. And I'm a historian. You don't know these things. But understand this as a tinderbox. Could the coronavirus be the thing with their beloved Islamic medicine of, of the state, not of the people? Could that be the spark? Could that be the flame, the, the, the fume that gets ignited by this little boy throwing the matches? I don't know. But that's where we're headed, and I have little doubt that it's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for talking too long. And finally, last but not least. Sorry, sorry. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> and, and finally, last but not at all, this is Amanda. Well, um, okay. One of the first things that as Iranians uh, you hear, all these horrible things are done. Iranians did this, Iranians. Uh, Soleimani was Iranian and Khomeini and uh, the, the revolutionary guards and all these crimes against humanity that is happening, Iranians. But, and that really sort of makes me say, no, it's not Iranian, it's this regime. It's not the people of Iran. This regime hates America, this regime hates Israel, this regime hates Iranian women. You know why? Because they are afraid of all these three. America, Israel, and Iranian women. Because Iranian women have been fighting them throughout the 300 years that they were imported to Iran from Anatolia by the Safavid Turks who occupied Iran. They brought in Shiaism. Shiaism is not Iranian. And since they arrived, they have been trying to get, turn Iran into a, um, like a communist Soviet Union of Shiaism for themselves, which Khomeini succeeded to do, but uh, for a short time. But this has happened throughout the last 300 years that they have they have been in Iran. They have been, when foreigners occupied Iran, like the Qajars, Tur Tartars, or the Safavid Turks, they were the, the Shiite clergy were powerful because they were Shiite. But when the Iranian kings took over and people elected them, put them in power, like during the American Revolution, there was a, a democratic Iranian king uh, ruling Iran who was being talked about all over Western world. How wonderful and democratic Iran was and we should learn from them. But then afterward, the last one was massacred and killed and the Shia clergy took over again for another 100 years. But they have been fought against during the whole time. And the women have been the main part of fighting against clergy 
in Iran, Shiite clergy. Um, Sarah said that I have written a book. I did. The reason is that all these years that I have been activist, human rights activist, I have been trying to bring the voice of the people of Iran, sorry, the people of Iran to the West, to America. Because everybody talks about what the regime did. And then they don't say the Iranian regime. Obviously, easily, I do the same thing too. Iran did this, this. And so that has made Americans, with the influence that the regime has bought, with millions of dollars they have spent within the academia, they, they argue with me. They say, you don't know Iran. We know Iran better than you do. And the media and the, uh, the lobbyist organization that had taken over President Obama's White House. Uh, and so everybody says, Iranian, the Iranians have done this. Iranians have done that. But the main issue is here that when I talk about Iranian people, I keep, especially when the, the media and uh, uh, academia tell me, well, it's your own culture. And that really, as an Iranian woman, really is very insulting to me. Because that is not, this, what's going on in Iran now, has been going on for the last 40 years, is not my culture. My culture is the culture of women gods. Iran was established by women gods 8,000 years ago. Neolithian era in the Zagros Mountains, where I come from, there were women mother gods who ruled and they were obeyed. And that culture from mother gods has, has set the foundation and basis of Iranian culture, which is matriarchal, never patriarchal. For example, Persian language is a gender neutral. There is no he's, she's, hers, his, nothing. After all this, probably most of my life, I have lived in America, and I have spoken English, I still mix my E's and she's. It's not easy to get used to my brain to separate women and men. That's not Persian language. It's based on people are all the same. Gender doesn't come into discussion. That's one proof. Second, the, the third proof is, if you look at the Iranian uh, mythology compared to the Greek or Western mythology. Iranian mythology is all women gods. Women gods, protectors of children. Women gods, protector of nature. Women gods, protector of waters. Anahita, that was adopted by the Greeks and Romans. And his son, uh, Mithra, which Mithraism became, became a big, huge a religion in the West. Can I just say, sure. you said Anahita, and then you said he. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, I, I just, yeah. my husband keeps making fun of me. When I speak and I mix my, my husband is American. When I speak, she's, oh, you mean he, not she. I'm sorry, I did it. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So, um, the whole issue is that um, in, in our I Iranian culture is not Shiaism, is not really Islamism, is, not, is humanism. It's mother gods, it's matriarchal society. It's not patriarchal society and will never ever accept the, this regime Shiite. This, in this book that I made some signs in here too, I wrote this book because I wanted to introduce my culture to Americans and tell them, no, please, 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 don't call them Iranians. We are, this is Iranians. 
We've lived 8,000 years. We have 3,000 years of history. And you just heard some of it from, uh, and, 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 and then we were very frightened him, not us. <laughs> but we are, we are proud people. These, this picture was taken 111 years ago. These were the women who fought for constitutional revolution in Iran against the clergy and Tatar rulers. And they fought, they established this secret society of the ladies because the clergy were fighting their husbands, their brothers, their fathers to keep them uh, down as you know slaves, gender apartheid. These women fought the clergy, and then they had we had the the, uh, the Iranian kings Reza Shah and then his son, who supported these women <coughs> because they 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 needed the Khomeini was fighting with them against them. And they fought against Khomeini and against all of them. And by 1979, in, by, during 70s, mid, mid, middle 60s, we were uh, completely equal. All the Sharia laws were removed. We had three women senators. One of them was the head of uh, the International Women's uh, Lawyers Association. We had two, uh, we have 28 members of the parliament, and we had two members of the cabinet, one of whom was executed by Khomeini because she refused to say, I am guilty of, uh, of uh, well, they accused her of letting go prostitution because she let the girls at the schools wear shorts. She was the secretary of education. She used to be my, uh, my high school principal, but they killed her because she refused. She said, I will refuse to say I'm guilty or I have done anything wrong, and they killed her. But you see, the whole issue is here that my culture, my country, my, uh, my whole civilization is completely ignored and everything is focused on a group of non-Iranian. We do not believe these people are Iranian. That's why they are friends with Hezbollah, because they are related. Khamenei's nephew, uh, niece, is, you see, nephew and niece. Khamenei's niece is married to the guy who leads Hezbollah right. in Lebanon. They are all related. They have been related for all these centuries. They have ruled us. And so uh, the whole misunderstanding in America, and of course it's propaganda by the regime. They know how to manipulate the Western societies and Western uh, uh, understanding of, of us. But what that has happened that 2009 President Obama, I don't know if I have time or not, 2009 President Obama ignored 8,000 people, all those women they killed on the street, and the, the video was went viral from Neda Allah Sultan. He completely ignored. And for eight years during Obama, people were quiet because they knew they don't have any support from the West. Now, when, since Trump has been the president, and he has expressed his support for the people of Iran, there is uprising every day. There is truck drivers park their, their trucks for miles and miles on the roads, and they don't work. There is the, the, the teachers, they go on strike. There is constantly uprising against this regime but the news doesn't get out into the Western world. Now, the only reason, the only way that this, what uh, he was talking about, can be possible is when the Western Europeans <coughs> and the United States all tell the regime they're not going to support them anymore. France, 
Germany, and England. These are the powers that are still giving them hope to abuse the people of Iran and stay in power. So if these three countries, China, forget about China, Russia, they have taken what they wanted. They took the Caspian Sea and the regime gave it to them. So what we need right now is to push these three Western European countries, and of course the Scandinavians, all of them. They, they, they have, they're paying, uh, um, anyway. So <coughs> what we need now is to push for, uh, for the Western European to stand by the people of Iran and tell the regime no more support. That that's gives the people of Iran the hope that they, next time, okay, they're gonna get killed, their children will be massacred and all of that, but there is hope for future. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. um, talk about cultural appropriation. Yeah. The regime basically stole your, oh, yes. your, your culture, Actually. your people's culture. It's horrible. So as a moderator, I'd like to um, take the liberty of the first question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, it's, it's essential, I think, that we we say it's essential that we say um, that we communicate somehow to the protesters on the street that we are with them. We don't want to make, and I know that President Trump has done that, but is there any any recommendations that you can make so that the people on the street know that they're not alone? I, I borrowed from a note in my own people's history when Congressman Jackson and Vanna used the, um, the Soviet um, Jews that wanted to emigrate to the United States to, to break the back of the Soviet Union. And now we have all these beautiful protesters on the streets. How can we communicate to them that we're with them and they're not alone? Mm -hmm. I'll try one. Um, yeah, there's a range of things that we can and should do, pending our internal situation. Because we're trying to do things, and then I explain and made the case that because of domestic opposition here, we were not able to. At least let's know what we can do. First of all, the broadcast. We have a Farsi broadcast, and I know all my friends here are aware of this and have raised the issue, that is compromised. We need to um, renew, reform, and give a push to the Farsi broadcast here, and how our allies in Europe do the same. Because that's half of the battle. When De Gaulle was in uh, France, and was the British who helped him have the broadcast into occupied France and the resistance began. When we had Radio Free Europe during the Cold War, I know many of my friends whose parents were living under the East European Soviet uh, control, they used to tell me, and they told me, that it was thanks to Radio Free Europe, the Voice of America. We have an issue here that needs to be addressed. That's very practical and obviously one. Second, an issue that is very difficult, and it's really up to the Iranians, and most of the Iranians abroad, to resolve it and help. What they need to do is to have this unified uh, leadership, because frankly, I'm in the media every day, both in America and in the region. Uh, we need to have symbols, representatives, of the Iranian leadership. We have Guaido in Venezuela, so we know that Guaido and his government and his members of the parliament are a face we can work with and so on and so forth. We had Lech Walesa in Poland, we have Akhav Havel. You know, you need to have representatives. There is probably an issue among Iranians overseas, it's not my domestic, you know, not my, my part to resolve, but let's suppose that this is resolved. I would strongly advise the administration to give them visibility <coughs> because we tweet about it, we talk about the Iranians, but we want to see Iranian leaders in the White House like the Afghan resistance against the Taliban was invited here. So there are many things that we can do, symbolic and otherwise. And obviously, you know, in the region there are so many things that the administration has become, has started to do, like stopping the Iranians, like taking care of the terrorists on the ground. Obviously more things could be done in terms of pushing back against the Iranian-backed militias, 
because that travels to Iran immediately. The more we weaken the Iranian militias in Iraq, or pro-Iranian militias in Iraq, the more you're going to see more demonstrations inside Iraq. So this is a range of things that we can do from Pennsylvania Avenue all the way to Baghdad. I have one very happy. Please go ahead. Um, also, uh, there is, uh, when Soleimani was killed, people pulled out the streets, started dancing. That's why Khamenei immediately said three days of mourning. So everybody knew no laughing, no being dancing on the streets. But the main issue is that Iran, inside Iran, they need a communication system that the regime cannot control. They need internet system, secured by America or Israel that can be uh, that can be given to the people. Of course, we are all here. There is Iranian community and friends of Iranian community that this that makes it possible for people to contact each other and organize themselves without just pouring out to the street and getting massacred. They are ready. They are with us. I talk to them all the time. One of them is my cousin, who says the regime is bringing in Arabs and giving them houses in our city because they want to control, because they are afraid of Iranian nationalism, Iranian Iranianism. So what we need is is a support that the people that can can help the people organize without the regime finding out or interfering or cutting them off. Let me just first uh, agree with the comments of both Vanda and, and Wally. Broadcasting is absolutely critical. Uh, secure internet or secure communications, absolutely critical. But there's a, there's a third thing, is that uh, this administration, this administration, the President, the Secretary of State, they do not control the United States government. And I'll give you a very specific example. Recently, they sent uh, a, the Iran desk officer from the State Department to Los Angeles to meet with Iranians. Who did they meet with? They met with pro-regime people. Yeah. And all of the people who were against the regime, oh, no, no, we're not going to meet with you. We need to get rid of, right here in Washington, the people in the government you can call them the deep state if you want. You can call them the pro-regime faction because that exists as well. Get them out of government. Get them away from the levers of power that the president put in his people uh, to get his job done. Absolutely. And also, also at Voice of America, it's exactly the same thing. I've been told that the reason, uh, and I have a little bit of insider knowledge on this, but I've been told that the reason the president has not appointed it a new head of our uh, of our international broadcasting is because it's too small a budget, it's seven hundred and forty four million dollars, and he's got bigger things to fight than to deal with seven hundred and forty four million dollars. So now he let Secretary Pompeo at the State Department do what Voice of America should have been doing, do what Radio for Europe, Radio Farda should have been doing all along, which is to magnify all of those tweets from inside Iran, which is to magnify the videos. We know those videos; they've been getting broadcast. You know, the people going around the American flag and the Israeli flag, thanks to Mike Pompeo. God bless him. <coughs> but you know, we do have an organization that is supposed to do that kind of thing. It's called the Voice of America and Radio <coughs> Freedom, and it's occupied by fake news. Okay, uh, first question over there. Yes. Thank you. Um, in the United Kingdom, we have a very similar problem uh, at the moment to the one you just described, in that we have as you may have noticed, just recovered our sovereignty. Um, <laughs> and, we, um, and we now have the only fully functioning democracy in Western Europe. Uh, and we have a strong and intelligent prime minister and an extremely disloyal uh, civil service. Uh, and the Foreign Office, as I think is well known, uh, was prominent in helping draft the European <coughs> Union side of the Iran uh, deal. And it has advised uh, Boris Johnson uh, to take the position which he currently takes, which is to continue 
to represent the Iran deal as mm -hmm. the only road to go. So my question is very simple to the panel, which is if you were in a position to advise the Prime Minister, what would you say to him to persuade him that he has been wrongly advised? Can I, I can uh, respond. Uh, just uh, because the, the issue, you know, England and Iran, Iranians don't read to the fact of history. We don't trust the British. Well, we're good reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, for, for, for a long time of you know, colonialism and so on and so forth. But there is one issue. If it is for Western European countries, it's a business the deals that they make with Khamenei and with the revolutionary guards and so on and so forth. If it's the economy that Western European countries want. I mean, this is not the only, if Iran is a democratic free country, well, fine, we don't want to hoard the oil or we can be free and you can buy whatever and sell whatever to the government, to a democratic government in Iran. So why keep these people and make Iranians not trust Western Europeans? <coughs> That's the problem. Uh, building on what Manda has said, which is at the heart of the problem, what the prime minister ears should hear. That's the first battle. Who is briefing him mm -hmm. and how yes. to get the message to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. If that is resolved, meaning I would imagine a number of lawmakers, because in the UK, lawmakers, government are very much connected. One depend on the other. And the Prime Minister depend on the majority. So he would listen seriously to members of his own party, at least. So if members of the British Parliament bring in very serious leadership of the Iranian opposition for a briefing with the Prime Minister, and he hears what Menda has said, of course, after organizing that, those thoughts, that the bet that you have on this regime are wrong bet for the interest, the national interest of, of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. It's not just, it is a just cause. There are a lot of just causes. But someone should explain to him, first from his own party, and then those exiled Iranians, that if you continue with the Iran deal, Iran regime is gonna fall anyway, and you're not even in line with your Arab allies who are also contained. So if you bring the Arab coalition, you bring the Iranian opposition, and you bring lawmakers, I think the prime minister will be interested. Yes. I, assuming, all right, thanks, thank God for Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump will probably be elected. Uh, and I assume that that's what the Iranians are waiting out. Assuming Trump gets elected, uh, do you see the possibility the Iran, that of the regime just lashing out in its dying days? Because they have lots of weapons. And do you see the possibility of them doing what Saddam Hussein did to a little bit, uh, attacking Israel as a way of attempting to get some solidarity in the Muslim world, probably would fail, but that's what they would do. Do you see that as a possibility? It is a very good question, and, and thanks for asking it. Uh, first of all, the Iranian regime will constantly tell you that uh, Trump is going to fail in 2020. He cannot be reelected. And we're going to do everything to make sure that he does not get reelected. So that's sort of the tell. They are very worried that they're going to face four more years of an actual American administration that decides to deal with them for the first time ever. They are very worried about that. Will they strike out wildly? Will they attack Israel? Well, look, they've been, the Israeli Air Force has a little experience with the Iranians uh, that they've been gathering over the past couple of years in Syria. And you might notice, if you follow that in the media, that the raids of the Israeli Air Force on Iranian arms shipments to Hezbollah in Syria become increasingly frequent, increasingly effective. And you begin to wonder how the Iranians are going to continue to supply Hezbollah. I don't think the Iranian regime, uh, looking at Israel today, sees an easy target. They see the work that's been done on missile defense, 
even uh, defense against mortar attacks, with all the panoply going right down to David Sling and a new laser weapon that they're working on as well. The Israelis are capable to uh, capable of defending themselves in ways that we are not here in this country. We do not have the extent of uh, uh, missile defenses that they have. Will they uh, strike out against the United States? Well, here's the thing. Harold mentioned to you that uh, the notion, this notion of self-preservation, they are protecting themselves. I can guarantee you that General Esmail Kigani, who was named the successor to Qasem Soleimani within 24 hours of his demise in Baghdad, Mr. Ghani uh, has a prick in his neck these days because he is constantly <laughs> looking over his shoulder and up at the sky wondering when that drone is going to take him out. And he knows that should he give the order for an attack against the United States Embassy in Baghdad, which was under preparation at the time that uh, Soleimani was killed, or a U.S. Embassy someplace else, or U.S. military facilities, and this president is still in power in the United States, he knows that he's next to go. And he knows as well that we know where he is and where he's going. And that has a remarkably sobering effects <laughs> on the Iranian military. <coughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I think Harold wants to say a few words. Please remember self-preservation. Remember the stories of the students, as I was saying, all of a sudden being pro somebody. They had no idea who he was, but they thought he was the winner. This is Iranian culture. They know how to sense these things. The truth is that a lot of the uh, Revolutionary Guard leaders um, have um, tried to make inroads uh, or, or connections with people outside the country, and they can very easily, in the middle of a sentence, remember all of a sudden all these guys are being beaten, and all of a sudden, well, we have a Shah, why do we need another? If these people who are running the country sense that they're in trouble, they know, uh, they know very well uh, how to, how to, let's say, have a safe landing. I would just say one other thing. I remember I, 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 you know, I used to teach uh, Islamic history, and I had a, an Iranian student who um, told uh, the class that he, had, he was one of uh, five or six brothers, I don't remember, the son of a, a, a senior Ayatollah. And one day, the father got everybody together, this is again in the late 70s, and said, um, all the sons, it's like, um, you know, we have to make sure that we are okay, whoever rules the country. They sensed that the Shah was in trouble. He had one son, my, that is, they, when my student had a brother who was in the, uh, the Shah's political party in parliament. He was an another one who was part of the Mujahideen al Khalq, a, a really an Islamic terrorist organization um, that we hear about a lot here. And uh, another was in the religious establishment. And another, it went on and on. <coughs> you know, whoever wins, I got somebody there, I'll be okay. They know how to do this. <laughs> if they see that it is finished, and they're going to detect it much more, much better than we will. Again, my own self, I didn't know what was going on, but the Iranian people did. Um, they'll find ways out of this. And they will wake up people who supported this regime, who were, well, um, who were actually, you know, uh, yes, that is, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I have been all along working with the opposition and this and that. We have an improvement in ways to it. The, this is Iran. It's Iranian culture. Okay. Um, we just have time for one question, and we have to answer very briefly because many of us have to be out of here in five minutes. So, yes, Deborah. Um, yeah, I just want to know do you believe that the Democrats that oppose the killing of Solomon? really believe mm -hmm. that, or was it just like they hate Trump so much, whatever he does, they want the opposite. And I also just wanted clarification from you, Ken, because I don't really know that much about it. The, the government officials here that went to talk to the Iranians, were they were they uh, congressmen, so or were they like, Senator. you know, people you can really get rid of, or they have to be voted out? Okay, that is a very good point that you raised. Yeah. So recently there was a meeting between Senator Chris Murphy, Senator Chris Van Holland, 
and uh, and uh, Lurch, uh, uh, John Kerry, who um, Jean Francois Kerry, who uh, <laughs> met with the um, Foreign Minister of Iran uh, without having uh, briefed the State Department apparently ahead of time. With and, and the president said, "Well, this is a violation of the Logan Act. It may be, it may not be." But here's the kicker. These are not individuals who all of a sudden realize that they've got a problem uh, because of President Trump and, of, and that the poor regime in Tehran is being mistreated. These are people who have for decades been pro-Islamic regime in Tehran. And we have people here in Washington who for decades prefer an Islamist regime in Tehran to a Jewish uh, democracy in Israel. Thank you. Well, uh, on that sobering note, um, I really want to thank all of you for coming, and especially our illustrious panel here. Thank you so much. Hey guys, you do me a favor. Take one of these uh, things that we're running.